Dung, this is quite a ticket you have here. I see you've been on an extensive trip. Africa, Europe, and even Israel. Yes, it's a trip I'll never forget. We visited many wonderful places, none more interesting than Israel. Thank you, Mr. Young. Israel, that is interesting. We're hearing a great deal about that new country these days. By the way, my name is Muntz. Muntz. J. Palmer Muntz. That's right. How do you know? Well, I know the Lake Bible Conference, of course. I can readily understand your interest in Israel. Don't you have an annual conference on prophecy and the Jew? We surely do. Bible students from all over America gather each year at Winona Lake to discuss the significance of current events relating to Israel especially as these developments are presaged in Bible prophecy. But frankly, our primary desire is to reach Jews all over the world with the truth that Jesus of Nazareth is their promised Messiah. Israel certainly is a fertile field for Christian missionary activity. By the way, what was your reason for going to Israel? My reason for going to the Holy Land was the same as that of countless other Christians who, for centuries past, have gone there to see with their own eyes the land where Jesus lived and died. Would you mind telling me all about it? Gladly. I was especially impressed with changeless, timeless quality of the places I saw. People seemed to be coming and going there as they must have come and gone for centuries. There's something about the Near East which sets it apart as different from all the rest of the world. Here, tradition is still a respected concept. And yet, with all its ancient customs and traditional manners, the 20th century invasion is seen on every hand, an invasion of Western clothing and bright, shining gadgets. Ancient streets, which have for centuries known only Eastern ways, are now looking out on a strange new world, a world of begrudging acceptance of concepts both new and foreign. One cannot help but sense an indifference here to the modern tempo of Western life. A leisurely, casual pattern of activity is seen on every hand, an unhurried pace, a prosaic outlook bordering on fatalism. The Arab of Jerusalem, although now a city dweller, is essentially a son of the desert, a nomad. Since the dawn of history, this troubled land has been a highway for rampaging armies. Egyptians sweeping to the north, the Medes and the Persians from the east, Greeks and Romans from the west, Napoleon, General Allenby. Since it was strategically located on the main overland route from the north to the south, most of these military leaders considered Palestine not so much as a prize in itself, but rather as a means to an end. Scars of this history are seen everywhere, as evidenced in the ancient ruins of battles long past, in the retarded state of economic development, but most of all, as seen in the lines of care and worry etched on the faces of its people. War has passed this way many times, none more devastating than the Arab-Israel War. Leveling peaceful homes and churches, erecting grotesque monuments in their places. Massive walls can be crushed by modern bombardment, but barriers of racial prejudice erected in the hearts of men constitute an insurmountable Maginot line of hatred. The Wailing Wall is now deserted. What was once the scene of praying Jews is now a lonely, dead-end street where only the steps of an Arab soldier on guard to keep the Jews away can be heard. For centuries, Jews came from every land to write their prayers on bits of parchment, to beat their heads against these massive limestone courses, to grieve their hearts in agony because of their dispersion. Many are the Jews who have wailed here anticipating the Messiah's coming praying for that day when the Chosen One of Israel, David's son, would redeem the nation. Jerusalem, never to be forgotten, is the thrill of passing through Bethany and over the shoulder of the Mount of Olives. 
There it is, spread out before you. One of the oldest cities in the world, and to the student of Bible lands, easily the most important. A few miles from Jerusalem at the outskirts of Bethlehem, we came upon the cave of the shepherds where the shepherds who watched their flocks by night heard the announcement of the Messiah's birth. The Church of the Nativity is enshrined in our minds as the site of the Savior's birth. At the tiny entrance to the church, we thought of the words of Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. One of the high points of our trip was seeing the ancient earthen pottery in the home of Professor Sukenik, in which the famous Dead Sea Scrolls of the book of Isaiah were discovered. These seldom photographed manuscripts, which were recently discovered, are the oldest Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament extant, reputed to have been in existence several hundred years before the time of Christ. Of outstanding archaeological value, the Isaiah scrolls establish beyond any question that one man was under inspiration of God, the author of that major prophetic work. Professor Sukenik translated for us from the original Hebrew Isaiah's description of the suffering servant who carried our sorrows was bruised for our iniquities. How natural to go from Isaiah to the place of the skull to Calvary itself, to that site which is accepted by most evangelical scholars as the authentic place of the crucifixion of our Lord. walk down the side of Calvary, at the bottom of the hill you come to the garden tomb. Here one must pause to read the words of Matthew, describing the glory of that first Easter morning when the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled back the stone from the door, saying, Fear not ye, he is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. From the garden tomb, we went to the Mount of Olives, which dominates Jerusalem on the east. It thrilled us to stand there and read these words from the Acts. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Shall so come in like manner. These words, like the tolling of a bell, keep ringing in my ears. Since returning from the Holy Land, I've been unable to forget them. I sincerely believe they are the most important words in the world. Speaking of the second coming of Christ, you might be interested in an article I've just been reading in Christian Life magazine, in which the editors have reiterated the idea that perhaps we have only a short time left before the end of this age. I've been a student of Bible prophecy for years, and have been especially interested in those signs of the end time relating to the nation of Israel. Did you see anything in the Holy Land which would indicate a possible fulfillment of prophecy? Yes, I certainly did. In fact, I returned from the Holy Land with an altogether different feeling than I expected to have. Visiting the historic shrines of Christianity was, of course, of great interest and blessing. 
but I was equally impressed with the things that are occurring in that land today. Events unfolding in Israel before our very eyes. As you look out over the New Jerusalem, after crossing the 50 yards from the Arab-held Old Jerusalem through the famous Mendelbaum Gate, you'll be impressed with a marked contrast between two civilizations living side by side, yet centuries apart in character. In contrast with the 10th century Arab world, with its primitive housing, shops, and transportation, we have modern Jewish Jerusalem, commerce and trade, business activities of every sort, architecture reflecting all the advantages of contemporary design and utility, shops catering to all the desires of Western living. Women of Israel find the window displays of Zion Square as irresistible as American women on Fifth Avenue. The traffic problems peculiar to city life in the Western world have invaded even the Holy City. And of course, Tel Aviv, the hill of eternal spring. For a number of years, the only truly Jewish city in the world, now one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in all of the East. In the great cities of Israel, one feels the pulse of a nation awakening to its rebirth. Not since Solomon's reign has the nation's heart beat with such enthusiasm and vigor. Standing in front of the Knesset building, which houses the National Legislature, I realized that for the first time in over 2,000 years, Israel is a nation again. She has written her own constitution, coins her own currency, and the shield of David proudly hails her freedom. The menorah, the seven-branched candlestick of Solomon's temple, now adorns the legislative house. On every hand, the ancient symbols fit into the modern setting. The sheaf of wheat, suggesting the continuance of Israel's seed. Perhaps you also will think of Isaiah 1-7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And again you will see the fig tree being used as a national symbol. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. War always strikes terror to the human heart. The world well remembers that on the very day that the existence of the infant state of Israel was announced, five proud Muslim nations proclaimed they would push the Jews into the sea and return the land to the Arabs of the Middle East. Superiority of manpower and resources of war were on the side of the Arabs. Forty million Muslims surrounded a small island of only 650,000 Jews. The passion to destroy the Jewish state possessed every class of Arab, from peasant to pasha. What the world, particularly the Arabs, did not consider was the vigor of these men who make up the Hebrew Haganah. Here are men whose tempers have been forged in the concentration camps of Buchenwald and Dachau. Nor did a watching world take into account God's ultimate purpose for Israel, as revealed by such promises as that of Isaiah. And they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, and have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those who serve themselves of them. The God of Israel fought for his ancient people, although they were not aware of it. El Shaddai, the Almighty, had revealed himself. This was the hour for their deliverance. Gladness and song, the sound of dancing was heard throughout the length and breadth of the land 
as young and old gave vent to their joy in the ancient victory dance, the Hora. The existence of the new state of Israel owes much to an army of men, women, and children, valiant heroes, the evidence of whose sacrifices are seen in every part of the land. If I forget Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Grim relics of trucks, tanks, and other military equipment are left alongside the highways as a perpetual reminder of a courageous people who have won a monumental victory. Over the Knesset building, where the Jewish parliament meets in legislative session, there is a flag, the first Jewish flag in modern history. It was Isaiah who wrote, He shall set up an ensign for the nations. Here is a democracy with its own president now. One day it will have a divine king. Within the political and religious framework of the new state of Israel, there are many devoutly orthodox Jews, keenly conscious of their ancient heritage, dating back over 4,000 years. This orthodox Jewish segment of the Israeli population controls in many elections the actual balance of power and is campaigning for a stricter application of the Mosaic Law. It is deeply significant that prayer is offered daily throughout the land for the coming of the Messiah. Children of Orthodox parents are being raised in the ancient Hebrew tradition and at an early age are learning again the ancient promises of the prophets who spoke of the Messiah of Israel. One segment of the population, called Zealots, lives in momentary expectation of that Messiah's appearing. Zealot leaders forbid the acceptance even of the temporal authority of the Jewish state. They deny that the government has any right to legal existence until the Messiah comes. It is among these and other Jews in the new state of Israel that I believe you will find a fertile ground for the gospel. Many of these people would gladly receive the good news of the true messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth. At the Rock of Judgment at Maron, I was interested to learn that the Hasidim Jews have selected a place where they expect the Messiah to sit in judgment upon the world, thus indicating their keen messianic expectancy. This is located high amid the Galilean hills, adjacent to the ruins of an ancient synagogue where the tablets of the law were once hidden and preserved. In all these gestures of age-long hope, the very land itself seems to cry out, How long, O Lord, how long? Well, this messianic consciousness on the part of the nation of Israel is certainly very interesting to those who are students of Bible prophecy. It's remarkable that even though, as Paul tells us, the nation is blinded in part, their vision obscured by unbelief, they nevertheless do feel the pulse of history, the tide of destiny, and recognize that the God of Abraham is bringing back his people into their promised land. Because you're a student of Bible prophecy, you'll be especially interested in the modern city of Haifa, one of the most important places in Israel today. Spreading out over the shoulder of Mount Carmel, dominating the blue Mediterranean across the Bay of Acre, it is today host to more immigrants than any other city in the world. Not only is it the principal seaport for commerce and trade, but it is for many of Israel's immigrants the port of entry. Its varied and colorful street scenes constitute the first impression of the new immigrant. Its gently sloping streets, winding through residential and business areas, open new vistas of opportunity to the newcomer. 
It is to Haifa first that many of the lost sheep of Israel return. Return across the sea from the torture chambers of Germany, from behind the Iron Curtain, Poland, Hungary, Romania, from Iran and Yemen, from Africa and the islands of the sea, a continual stream of aching humanity in search of freedom and a nation of its own. Witnessing the unloading of an immigrant ship, I wondered, is this what Isaiah meant when he wrote? And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. You will meet people over 100 years of age who will tell you they have come back to the promised land not to die there, but to welcome the Messiah whose coming they confidently expect. It is to people such as these that then Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, in his address on the occasion of the second anniversary of Israel's independence, significantly quoted Isaiah 43, 5 and 6. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. In the first 20 months of its existence, the new state of Israel absorbed approximately 250,000 immigrants into its economy, which, on a percentage basis of the population, would be equivalent to 55 million in the United States. In another 16-month period, 275,000 immigrants entered Israel. Of this amount, 27% came from Poland, 27% from the Balkan countries, 16% from the Middle East, 12% from Central Europe, 11% from North Africa, 3% from Russia, and 3% from the other parts of the world. The state of Israel probably constitutes the largest shift of population in recent world history. This phenomenal return of a dispersed people so frequently alluded to in the Bible should challenge every Christian to search the scriptures anew and to note what is happening about him in the world of prophecy. It is not for me to say that that which is happening in Israel constitutes a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I am simply reporting to you what I have seen and heard. Certainly, however, no one can afford entirely to ignore these things. These happenings in Israel are thought-provoking enough to cause the Bible student also to ask the question, How long, O Lord, how long? The reception center at Haifa is in every sense of the word a melting pot. It is to this temporary camp that the Jewish immigrants are taken immediately upon their arrival into the country. Here they meet new friends from all over the world, Europe, Asia, North Africa, India, the Western Hemisphere, and the islands of the sea. It is at this reception center that one witnesses the miracle of the preservation of Jewish identity. Victims of the diaspora, scattered literally to the corners of the earth, subjected to every form of economic, social, and moral discrimination, have remained yet a separate people. It was prophesied of this long ago. Behold a people dwelling alone. They shall not be numbered among the Gentiles. For many of these people, 
A friendly handshake is an unbelievable kindness. To all, there is the happy confidence that no ghetto awaits them here, that no police state will victimize their lives. Standing on the street of the reception center camp, one cannot help but recall the words of the psalmist. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. The wilderness and the solitary place shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. The sterile soil, which has long been regarded as utterly worthless for agricultural purposes, is now the scene of lovely citrus groves and flourishing gardens. Where cactus formerly grew, vegetable gardens now abound. Where thorns and thistles once held way, the lilies of the valley bloom again. When I asked one of the farmers the secret of all this, he replied, work water, and a love for the land. Of work I saw plenty, back-breaking work, painstaking labor in rock-strewn fields, work with primitive tools, as especially found among the Arab citizens of the infant state who are reluctant to adopt the more modern agricultural methods as employed by the Jewish immigrants. The work is carried on with whatever tools are at hand, but always you find that rare devotion to a sacred task, work. Barren rock is being removed from hillsides. It is this simple ingredient, so despised by much of the world today, human labor, which is literally changing the face of this ancient land. Israelites of every age and both sexes are called upon to do their part in the task of reclaiming the land. Young trees are patiently planted and nursed along in a manner suggestive of the words of Ezekiel. This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited. Work and water. Herein lay the answer to the skeptic's question, was Palestine worth the effort? As a result of the skillful use of water resources, Israel can now claim greater wealth per square foot than any other undeveloped country in the world. This humble threshing floor of contending nations, whose value was chiefly as a highway for their armies, is now revealing through the beneficent hand of God its true purpose as the promised land, unconditionally given to the fathers through the Abrahamic covenant. For some years it has been known that one of the great underground lakes of the world has been beneath the maritime plain of Israel. Its resources awaited development at the hands of a new generation of Jews whose ingenuity and technical skill could put it to practical use. Water brings power, and power generates life. The desolate land is surrendering to a carpet of vegetation. Israel is a study in contrasts. In the heart of a modern semi-industrial land, we have one of the oldest cities of the world, Acre, with a nomadic Arab population enjoying a traditional medieval leisure. This struggle between the Arab sons of Ishmael and the Israeli sons of Isaac continues unresolved. The fact that the old city of Jerusalem is still under Arab control and that every nation is permitted entry there except the Jews reminds us of the prophecy of Luke. And, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. Scriptures predicted that the city of Jerusalem would expand and enlarge, spreading out to the south and to the west and finally to the north, but at no time to the east. Today, Jewish suburbs surround the old Arab quarters on every side, but to the east.
Toward the east, a cemetery of Jehoshaphat bears silent testimony to that prophecy. In tradition claims that Jesus passed through the golden gate of the eastern wall on his way into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. This gate has been sealed shut for centuries, but it is believed in Jerusalem that on the day that the Messiah returns to judge the nations, the gate will be reopened and he will pass through it, returning to the city. Palestine, once a valley of dry bones, has become a place of noise and activity, reminding us of the vision of Ezekiel. Injury, commerce, and trade have become as sinews and flesh upon the bones of a once apparently dead nation. The flesh of the people coming upon them give the Jewish nation form again. Miniature Pittsburghs are springing up in the heart of industrial Galilee. Electric power, so vital to industry, is once again available to keep factory output at its maximum. Do we not have here everything but the spiritual resurrection spoken of by the prophet? Are we not but awaiting the breath of God to bring to fulfillment Ezekiel's prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones? In the very shadows of the ruins of ancient villages, modern prefabricated houses are going up. Also, as foretold by the prophet Ezekiel, the waste cities are being built up before our very eyes. Construction work, farming, forestry, and agriculture all support this new expression of life. Though most of the immigrants have recently come from the merchant class and are unaccustomed to manual and agricultural work such as is required to reconstruct the land, they become remarkably adept in a short period of time. Theirs is the satisfaction at the end of each day, not only of building their homes, but the reward of building a nation. fearful at the end of the day, children confidently await dad's return. Onward they come, for saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company of them shall return thither. Crowded on the vessels from Europe, 40,000 by plane from Yemen, 123 people were brought in from Persia on this DC-4 alone, thousands more by bus and train from the Orient, from the East and from the West. And the Lord said of this, Give up, keep not back, bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Hear ye the words of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it to the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. World attention is focused on Israel today. World capitals are keenly aware of the international significance of what is transpiring in that tiny land. Metropolitan London, cosmopolitan Paris, as well as Rome, all are watching Israel today. I wonder if Christians are as keenly conscious of the import of recent events in Israel in the light of prophecy. Students of Bible prophecy have long believed that that which happens in Israel points the way to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men everywhere are asking the question, how much time is left? How much time to preach the gospel to the Jew first and then to a waiting world? What is the hour on the timepiece of eternity? 
How much time to complete the task of foreign missions, which has been assigned to us by the Great Commission? How much time do we have left to disciple men for the Master? How much time before the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord.